And a great pleasure to welcome back to the show today. She's been with us a few times before. Always great to talk with uh, Lynn Sure. You remember her, of course, from her uh, great work on ABC and all the uh, news programs there. She has a new book out, very fascinating book called Sally Ride, America's First Woman in Space. We're joined by Lynn today up in uh, New York. And uh, Lynn, I know it's uh, about a year or a year and a half ago we talked about the, the book on swimming. So uh, how have you been since then? I've been great, Doug. Thank you. How about you? I'm doing great. Uh, when I found out you, you had this book out, I, I contacted the, the book publisher I wanted to have you on and talk about. I've always been one of those uh, kind of space fans going back to uh, childhood, watching Apollo and all that. I know you covered it for many years, so this must have been an interesting project for you. It was. You know, it was sort of bittersweet in a way that um, Sally Ride was a close personal friend of mine as well as somebody right. that I covered for many years. And when she died two years ago uh, of pancreatic cancer, just 61 years old, uh, it was a real loss. But by doing the book, it's it's a way also of preserving her legacy and also digging in and, and telling folks a few things they just never thought about before. And uh, there were a, a number of surprises, even to me. Yeah, she, uh, and just from kind of knowing a little bit about her before and now reading your book, she was a private person anyway. So I guess it was a little bit of a challenge to kind of, uh, you know, find out more about her, right? Even though you knew her pretty well. You know, outside it of was the a work. big challenge. Yeah, yeah. A combination of dealing with a private person like Sally, who even though we were good friends, there were things I didn't know about her, and also dealing with the space agency, which, as you know, has never been known for being um, overly um, uh, 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 generous with information about no. the personal lives of the extra. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, it was kind of a challenge, but, you know, I, I did more than 200 interviews for the book. Um, I had access to Sally's papers, such as they are, and files, and, of course, there's all the public information, and there were some folks at NASA that were just terrific. So I've dug up all sorts of information, and I've spoken to a lot of her friends. I had her family exclusively. So I think this, this now is the most complete portrait ever of Sally Ride, and I think um, she is indeed an interesting character. You go back to the original uh, astronauts, Mercury 7, everybody knew who they were from all the articles they did, I guess, uh, in Life magazine and TV, and then even through Gemini and Apollo. But after that, it, it kind of faded out. People really didn't f know as much about the astronauts until Sally Ride was the first woman. There was coverage of that, I remember, but, but not as much, right? Well, there was huge coverage when Sally flew. In fact, NASA right. said that the demands on her and uh, requests for interviews were equal to what they were when Neil Armstrong first flew. Oh, they were. And okay. that's the kind of thing, yeah, it really, it really touched a nerve. And, you know, I think there's a reason why. I think that um, uh, millions of people, particularly women, particularly young women, um, looked at Sally's flight. This is June of 1983, exactly 31 years ago. In fact, um, as we are speaking right now in June of 2014, uh, Sally's mission, STS-7, was up and orbiting the planet. So this is exactly 31 years ago. And when she lifted off, I think what she did was she took a lot of people's hopes and dreams with them. And a lot of people, particularly women, particularly young women, looked at what she did, first American woman in space, and they said, if she can do that, then I can do anything. And it was a, it was a great translation of a very bold journey into the fact that the doors were now open, and this was symbolic as well as real for so many people to, to see what she did and pin their own hopes on that. Yeah, I didn't realize until I read the book how, uh, how good a tennis player she was. She was, uh, I guess, almost good enough. Maybe she would have been to uh, be on the Pro Tour at one time, right? She hoped to be on the Pro Tour. Yeah. She did play uh, girls' junior tennis and some uh, early women's tennis, but she always joked and when people said, why didn't you become a professional tennis player, Sally would always say, my forehand. <laughs> and I think, I think she, uh, she sort of figured out that she took, look, looked around her and saw how the elite played. And, you know, Billie Jean King was an early mentor of hers, and she said, look, I'm good, but I'm not that good, and dove right back into science. So uh, she was better than most of the people that you know, but she probably would not have made it into the top tier and Sally would not have been satisfied unless she was at the very top. I thought it was interesting uh, how you talk about it in, in the book. Uh, she just kind of saw an ad uh, for women to apply for uh, for the space program, for the, for the shuttle program. That's pretty much how she got in, right? Just applied for the ad originally. Well, it wasn't an ad, actually. It was an article. She article, was a, yeah. a, a student at uh, that She, interestingly, in her memory, it was an ad, which is very interesting. Uh, what it was, because I looked all through the Stanford Daily, 
um, she had gone, she was studying for her PhD, finishing up her thesis in astrophysics at Stanford University. It was January of 1977, and she goes to the Stanford Student Union, she gets a cup of coffee, she gets a donut, she sits down, picks up a copy of the Stanford Daily, and there above the fold is an article, and the headline is, NASA to Recruit Women. And this was an interview with a woman who was one of the women's organizations talking about the fact that NASA was reaching out and looking for women and minorities um, who were scientists to fly in the upcoming, then upcoming space shuttle program and hadn't flown yet. And the idea was they no longer needed to be military men. They no longer needed to be um, flyers. They needed to be scientists to do experiments and things in space. Sally took one look at the article read through the uh, qualifications for a mission specialist, said to herself, I can do that, and sent off immediately for an application. Hmm. I know, Quite uh, amazing. It really is when you kind of think of it. Uh, open to everybody who wanted to at least give it a shot, but uh, like you said, with the space shuttle program, it required different skill uh, skill levels. Obviously, you had to be a pilot if you're flying the thing, but other, other people exactly. would be on board, right? Precisely. The, the idea was the shuttle, as you well know, was more of a plane, a space plane, a lot more room for larger crews. So you did need two individuals to fly it. But the other members of the crew, and of course they got up to seven and more, um, were there to do experiments, to do all sorts of things, launch uh, the components and build the space station while they were orbiting Earth a couple of hundred miles up. So for the first time, NASA was looking for individuals who didn't have test pilot experience, who weren't fighter pilots, but um, who understood the cosmos, if you will, who understood how things worked and could go up there and really make a difference. You covered uh, her flight and many flights uh, with ABC. Uh, I always kind of envied you guys getting to be actually over there and, and see it take off. Uh, uh, you interviewed her, I'd imagine, before her, her flight then, right? I did. I interviewed Sally a number of times, and of course I interviewed her right before she flew in June of 83. And I think the most memorable uh, uh, back and forth we had was I said to her, do you feel under any pressure as America's first female astronaut? Of course, you well know there were two Russian women had gone up before, but right. we knew almost nothing about them. So she's the first American woman, and she's 32 years old. So I said, do you feel under pressure? She said, I do feel pressure not to mess up. And I think what <laughs> she meant was she didn't want to mess up for the crew. She didn't want to mess up for the mission, because any space um, mission is a team enterprise. She didn't want to mess up for NASA. She didn't want to mess up for the United States or for the future of human spaceflight. But mostly, she didn't want to mess up for women, because she knew that if she messed up, uh, in her terms, uh, then it would be seen as, well, no woman can ever be an astronaut. Whereas if she did well, then the door would be wide open. And indeed, she did brilliantly. And the door was indeed wide open from then on. Yeah, I guess that, that playing tennis and that competitive nature she had, you need to have some of that as an astronaut, but she had it, I think, before that, right? She had that in her. You know, I think, I think you're absolutely right. I think uh, playing tennis and being in front of the public gave her, number one, um, a chance to really hone her skills as a team player, and she really was a team player. She loved being part of a team. I think it also proved um, that she did have the right stuff, that is to say, cool under pressure, mm -hmm. knew how to win and knew how to lose. Didn't like to lose, but understood that when you lose, there's always another game, there's always another match, there's always another set. And I think these were very important qualifications for being an astronaut. And one very specific one, she had excellent hand-eye coordination, right. clearly part of her tennis background. And, of course, she was one of the experts at working the remote manipulator arm, you know, that giant sure. crane that flew on the shuttle. So I'm sure that had a lot to do with it, don't you? Yeah, I thought that was interesting how you described that in the book. She, she liked that part of it, that huge uh, arm thing that she uh, said her... Right. You know, she had good wrists and hand-eye coordination working that, that, uh, that machinery. That, that's, that's great. Did, did you get the impression uh, from talking to people? I didn't get it from the book that there was a lot of sexism from the men, and we kind of feel there might be some of that, men and women in, in that kind of industry, but they seemed to get along pretty well. Did, was that the case well, with her? Uh, yeah, I, I think what happened is once NASA made the decision to uh, invite, uh, to uh, not only to accept but to reach out for women and minorities, then they bent over backwards to make sure it all worked fine. Yeah. And the truth is that the individuals who came in with Sally's class were, for the most part, 
um, just fine with this. There were guys, I have to tell you, in Sally's <laughs> class, this is the astronaut class of 1978, there were guys who had not only never worked with women before, these were career military guys who had never worked out of a uniform. Oh. So they all had something to learn. Um, there were little things. There were lots of little things. There was a lot of good-natured ribbing. There were always a couple of people who stood in the way and just couldn't deal with the fact that women were there. But for the most part, absolutely, um, the women proved that they were equal partners, and that's the way they were accepted. Part of the book, too, you talk about her uh, personal life, which I had heard about later on and, and not much about it, uh, that she was gay, but uh, that didn't seem to be a big deal. Uh, talking to people, doing the book, uh, how was that to, to write about? I don't think it was a big deal to Sally either, uh, at the, at, finally, at the end, although she and I never had this conversation. Um, it turned out that Sally was living uh, in a relationship with another woman for 27 years. She had been married to um, fellow astronaut Steve Holy while she was at NASA for five years. Uh, they broke up, and she spent um, the better part of her life with a woman named Tam, Tam O'Shaughnessy, mm -hmm. um, who she leaves behind. And Sally and Tam were very private about their relationship. There were a couple of people, a small handful, who knew that they were in a relationship, and no one ever talked about it um, for a variety of reasons. I think uh, it turns out from the interviews that I did, I think Sally was trying to protect NASA, uh, NASA not known at the time, back when you know Sally was there in the 80s, not known for being a very open socially organization. Right. Um, I think she was trying to protect the astronaut office. And also um, she and Tam and some other people started a wonderful company, still exists, Sally Ride Science to get girls, uh, mostly girls and boys, middle school kids interested in math and science. And she was worried, they were worried that the idea of two gay women uh, might hinder their efforts to raise the kind of money they wanted. This is a for-profit company. Right. Um, it's, it makes me sad. I wish that she had felt she could be more public about the relationship because I would have liked to share it with them and been able to, you know, share in their happiness. But, you know, this was her decision. This is what she wanted to do. Uh, but that, of course, was the big news after she died when that news came out. Yeah. Yeah, by today's environment, I would think it probably you might make an announcement of it. It wouldn't be a big deal, but back in the 70s well, and 80s, precisely. it probably still would have been. And I think with the exception of some people in, in the gay community and some um, who are just opposed to anything, um, with the exception of them, I think most people thought, oh, that's a surprise, but okay, next, let's talk about whatever more is more important. I mean, this was not um, the cause that Sally chose to stand up for all of her life. She lived it. Uh, she didn't demonstrate about this kind of thing, and, and you know, more power to her. She just lived her life the way she wanted to. And ultimately, it has nothing to do with how good you are on your job anyway, so that it, it, it shouldn't matter. No question but, about that. But, but no. unfortunately for some people, it does. <laughs> just, exactly. Just no, it doing... shouldn't matter at all. And, no. You know, Sally, Sally chose to um, really speak out forcefully about women, about women in science, about women in sports, about space exploration, about science education. These were the causes that she chose to, to be very public about. The shame of it is, uh, as somebody, like I said, that was a fan of the space program, uh, there is really no shuttle program anymore. There's the space station, which you don't hear much about because uh, we don't do as much as we used to with it. But I kind of miss those days where you look forward to those missions, uh, watching it on TV. I, I hope it comes back. I'm sure you do, too. I do, as a matter of fact, although I have to tell you that uh, while the excitement isn't quite the same, I, I did watch um, one of the Soyuz. Of course, the way we get to the space station now is we hitch a ride on right. uh, Russian taxis, basically. <laughs> and I watched the Soyuz launch the other day, and it's still pretty exciting. And I think the fact that the, we have a permanently inhabited um, uh, vehicle orbiting vehicle, a, a, a station, much more than a vehicle orbiting the planet on a regular basis, and that... These folks, men and women, are up there, and they're beaming down uh, what they're doing. I think is still pretty exciting, and I think it's I think it's too bad we're not paying more attention to it. No. I know there are very demanding things here on this planet, but I think we belong in space as well. Yeah, just so many things came out of uh, the Apollo mission that uh, we use today. Cell phones, computers, just to name two, all the medical things. So it, it, it helped. <laughs> it created a lot of uh, things. It it certainly does. Yeah. Well, the name of the book is Sally Ride, America's First Woman in Space. We've been talking with uh, Lynn Schur today, and it just came out doing very well, published by uh, Simon & Schuster. Do you have a, uh, a specific website you want to give out, Lynn? Yes, if they go to Facebook, 
um, forward slash Sally Ride Bio, one word, S A L L Y R I D E Bio. Come on to our Facebook page for the Sally Ride Bio, and um, I post my schedule where I'm speaking, all sorts of wonderful things there, and you can post your own comments as well. Great. Lynn, always a pleasure to talk to you. Please uh, let us know when you're down in our area again. We'd love to have you uh, in person, but uh, always great to chat with you, and we'll talk to you when your next book comes out. Thanks so much. I really love it.